the 80s was truly the golden era for Steven Spielberg. In 1982, his film, E.T. The Extra Terrestrial, was a massive success that year, breaking all box office records. It was the biggest film of 1982. Few people realise, though, that he was responsible for one of the other blockbusters of that year, the horror film Poltergeist. Poltergeist is the 1982 supernatural horror film directed by Toby Hooper and was written and produced by Steven Spielberg. It starred Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams and was released on June the 4th, 1982 by Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Set in a suburban California suburb, the story revolves around the Freeling family, whose home is visited by ghosts. At first, the ghosts appear friendly, moving objects around the house to the amusement of everyone. But then they turn nasty and abduct the youngest daughter and terrorize the family. The stars of Poltergeist were all relative unknowns. Craig T. Nelson was in the 1980 Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder film Stir Crazy. J. Beth Williams was cast in Poltergeist as Diane Freeling. She is mainly known for her film roles in Stir Crazy, which also starred Craig T. Nelson. Her most famous role was in the Baby Boomers hit The Big Chill. The kids in Poltergeist were played by Oliver Robbins, Dominique Dunn and Heather O'Rourke as Carol Ann. Drew Barrymore was originally considered for the role of Carol Ann, but Steven Spielberg wanted someone more angelic. It was Barrymore's audition for this role, however, that landed her the part in E.T. The Extra Terrestrial. Heather O'Rourke starred on Happy Days as Fonzie's girlfriend's daughter for a year until the character and her mother were dropped from the show. Heather O'Rourke was chosen for the film when she was eating lunch with her mother and sister at the MGM commissary. Steven Spielberg came up to them and wanted O'Rourke for the part of Carol Ann. She initially failed the screen test because she kept laughing her way through the audition. Even when she was supposed to be afraid, Spielberg thought she was too young to take the part seriously, but he still recognized something special in her. So he asked her to come back for another audition, and this time bring a scary storybook with her. He also asked her to scream, so she screamed and screamed until she started crying. This audition got her cast as Carol Ann. Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper wanted virtually unknown actors to play the Freelings because they wanted to add a realism to the family that would off-balance the ghost story. They felt that if the audience watched well-known stars, that it would take away from the realistic feel of the characters. In reality, Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams were only 15 and 11 years older than Dominic Dunn, who plays their teenaged daughter. Zelda Rubenstein is an eccentric and unique actress who plays the medium Tangina Barons in Poltergeist. Incidentally, Zelda Rubenstein auditioned for the part of medium Tangina four times. She appeared in the John Hughes film Sixteen Candles and starred in the sequel to Poltergeist, Poltergeist 2, The Other Side in 1986, and the third film, Poltergeist 3, in 1988. James Caron, who played Mr. Teague at the time, was also a commercial spokesman for Path Mark Supermarkets. After playing his role on Poltergeist, he received hate mail from people saying they would never shop there again because of his character's treatment of the Freelings. Shirley MacLaine was offered a starring role in the film, but backed out in order to make Terms of Endearment in 1983. Steven Spielberg first approached Universal about distributing the film before he sold the idea to MGM. Spielberg was originally going to direct, but was busy directing E.T. the Extra Terrestrial and the clause in his contract with Universal Studios prevented him from directing another film at the same time. Therefore, Toby Hooper was selected. Spielberg hired Toby Hooper after being impressed with his work 
on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Steven lo loved Chainsaw. Steven Spielberg took on the role as the producer. This was Steven Spielberg's first film as a producer. Poltergeist is one of those rare films where Steven Spielberg has a writing credit. Spielberg offered Toby Hooper the script for E.T. the Extraterrestrial, but Hooper declined and Spielberg gave him the script for Poltergeist instead and directed E.T. the Extraterrestrial himself. Stephen King was briefly approached to write the screenplay. It would have been the first written by King directly for the screen, but the parties could not agree on the terms. When writers Michael Grouse and Mark Victor first met with Steven Spielberg, they were being hired to write the film that eventually became Always. When Spielberg happened to mention he also had an idea for a ghost story, Grouse and Victor said they'd rather write the ghost story than Always, and that's how they got the job. Originally as Tobey Hooper, Steven Spielberg and the screenwriters were plotting out the screenplay, Carol Ann was going to get killed in the first act and then haunt the house in the second. They eventually decided this was too dark and opted to have her kidnapped by the ghosts. In fact, eventually so many of the dark elements were removed because Spielberg wanted a PG rating so that the film could run as a double feature in theatres with E.T. Despite being a horror thriller film, there are no murders or fatalities depicted in the film. That was a technical experience. From a lighting standpoint, the most difficult scene became the sequence in the famous or infamous closet. The closet where everything goes into and comes out of. The closet with the spectral light. There were so many lighting effects. Strobes and Las Vegas spots and fish tanks of water to give a different kind of diffusion to the beams coming out. And four large wind machines and minutia and smoke. It was just to coordinate all that for a simple effect. We just didn't want a light, but we wanted the light to live, to really breathe and to exude a kind of a personality. I mean, we had spinning rooms, pulled one bed, the little girl's bedroom out and put put the parents' bedroom in for Joe Beth to go up the wall. Right, right. On the ceiling. And there was a luxury to that, though. It was, uh, it was the first, uh, uh, like, 90-day schedule. The miracle of Poltergeist is that the film was finished in the schedule, being as complicated as it was. It was hard to make because it was a special effect in every sequence, not just an optical effect, but a practical, mechanical effect. The special effects were made by Industrial Light and Magic and still today are quite impressive for their time. Poltergeist now was a ghost story set in contemporary times in the house next door. I learned everything I knew about special effects or everything. I mean, that was my introduction into ILM and also just a look and a, a behavior and the characters that that go along with a film like this that is that is a, a mainstream film that is measured mm -hmm. than than i was used to the scene where diane is attacked in her bedroom by an invisible force was actually filmed in a rotating box with a stationary camera this gave the appearance she was being dragged up the wall and across the ceiling the crawling stake was done by using a real stake which was laid over a slot cut between the tiles in the counter top. Two wires were fastened to the bottom of the stake and a special effects operator hidden under the counter simply moved the wires to make the stake crawl like a caterpillar. A similar operation was done when Diane presents to Stephen the chairs that move across the room by themselves. A wire was fastened to one of the chair's legs under the set. An operator first wobbled the chair with the wire, then dragged the chair across. The most fun I had in that was me doing one, one shot that is more like a magic trick than a special effect. And it's where the, the chairs stack up on the table. Oh, yeah. So Joe Beth picks Heather up and, and puts her on a part of the kitchen sink. And the chairs are spread out. Right. around the, the table and then she goes over to get the 409 bottle so there is a, a pre-constructed stack of chairs with two guys two two special effects men right beside the camera and then there were six other effects people waiting in closets underneath the counter 
And so started shooting and it took four seconds for everyone to pull the chairs out, run into other rooms. So two guys come out and put the, the assemble stack on the right. table and then make a dash out the back way. During the scene where Robbie, Oliver Robbins, is being strangled, the clown's arms became extremely tight and Robbins started to choke. When he screamed out, I can't breathe, Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper thought that the boy was ad-libbing and just instructed him to look at the camera. When Spielberg saw Robin's face turning purple, he ran over and removed the clown's arms. Both of the terrors that plague Robbie came from Steven Spielberg's own fears as a child. A fear of clowns and a tree outside his window. The clown puppet used in the film is on display in Planet Hollywood in Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas. Joe Beth Williams was hesitant about shooting the swimming pool scene because of the large amount of electrical equipment positioned over and around the pool. In order to comfort her, Steven Spielberg crawled in the pool with her to shoot the scene. Spielberg told her, Now, if the light falls in, we will both fry. The strategy worked and Williams got in the pool. The skeletons that emerge from the swimming pool while Diane searches for help are actual skeletons rather than plastic skeletons. Real skeletons were less expensive than the plastic skeletons. Joe Beth Williams didn't know this until after the scene was shot. Skeletons and ancient desecrated burial grounds crop up in other Spielberg productions like Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981 and Young Sherlock Holmes in 1985. The hands which pull the flesh off the investigator's face in the bathroom mirror are Steven Spielberg's. The scene in which Marty hallucinates in the bathroom was the last to be filmed. During all the horrors that proceeded while filming Poltergeist, only one scene really scared Heather O'Rourke, that in which she had to hold onto the headboard while a wind machine blew toys into the closet behind her. She fell apart. Steven Spielberg stopped everything, took her in his arms and said, that she would not have to do that scene again. For me, it was a, a you know, quite, quite a, both movies I've sort of been making together, E.T. and Poltergeist, are overlapping in post-production by only three weeks. I mean, I was cutting Poltergeist and then cutting E.T. only three weeks apart. And the same with the dub. We, we're, we're beginning to dub Poltergeist. Uh, two weeks before the dub is complete, E.T. will begin dubbing. So it's almost like making two movies at, at the same time. And I found that was in a way helpful because it gave me great objectivity. When I was working on Poltergeist, I had enormous clarity about E.T. And when I was suddenly involved in E.T., I had enormous clarity about Poltergeist. And I think that it, it helped both movies. The house that gets sucked into a black hole at the end was actually a model about four feet across. The model took several weeks to complete. The shot was arranged with the camera placed directly above the model, which was mounted over an industrial strength vacuum generator. The model also had about 100 wires attached to the various points of the structure. These wires went down through the back of the house and down through the vacuum collection sack. The camera was turned on and took 15 seconds to wind up to the required 300 frames per second. The vacuum was turned on, the wires were yanked, and several special effects guys blasted the house with pump action shotguns. The entire scene was over in about two seconds and they had to wait until the film was developed before they knew if they would have to do it again. Luckily, they got it right on the first take. The finished scene was sent to Steven Spielberg, who was on location shooting E.T. He gave it to the projectionist, who assumed it was dailies from E.T. and was startled by the images. Spielberg had the remains of the model encased in perspex and it is now sitting on his piano. Zelda Rubenstein filmed her part in six days. The sign at the Hotel Inn reads Welcome Dr. Fantasy and Friends. Dr. Fantasy is a nickname for producer Frank Marshall. Poltergeist and E.T. were filmed within 20 minutes of each location. Poltergeist was one of the few Steven Spielberg films not to feature music by John Williams. Poltergeist features a fantastic Jerry Goldsmith score. He wrote this theme song. The Poltergeist theme was criticized for being too Disney-fied 
and leave it to Beaver. Bullying the audience into an inappropriately cheerful and family friendly state. Since poltergeists typically are associated with a person and hauntings are associated with a place, we learn at the ending that this assessment was incorrect. When Stephen realizes that the house was built on a cemetery, that means it was actually a haunting, not a poltergeist. The word poltergeist is spoken three times and only once by three different characters. The sound effect for the beast that attacks the house at the end of the movie is the source for the current MGM line roar. Once post-production work on Poltergeist began in early 1982, Spielberg was in total control. He was responsible for the editing of the film. Spielberg's usual editor, Michael Kahn, edited this film, while Carol Littleton edited E.T. The final sound mixes and loops, the supervision of the visual effects, and the selection of Jerry Goldsmith as the composer of the score. Poltergeist and E.T. opened in theaters nationwide only a week between each other during the summer of 1982. Poltergeist on June the 4th and E.T. one week later on June 11th. Spielberg later said, if E.T. was a whisper, Poltergeist was a scream. Poltergeist was the highest grossing film of Toby Hooper's career. 1982 was truly the year of Steven Spielberg. Not only was E.T. a huge hit, but Poltergeist was too. Released by Metro Goldwyn Mayer on June the 4th, 1982, the film was a major critical and commercial success, achieving in being the eighth highest grossing film of 1982. The film grossed over 95 million worldwide on a budget of 35 million, making it the highest grossing horror film of 1982. Our next film is Steven Spielberg's new horror movie, Poltergeist, and the movie has some shockingly effective scenes, very violent and very slick, using the latest special effects technology. But it works best, I think, when it only suggests the terrible things that exist just beyond the boundaries of everyday life. I guess the idea is that the TV people or the spirits in possession of this house have occupied that closet and it's in the fourth dimension, so you can kind of go through it and come out through the living room ceiling. <laughs> the whole last half of this movie is filled with effects like that as evil spirits play games with the family's sanity. Well, why are these spirits so disturbed? Turns out the real bad guys in Poltergeist are the same villains Steven Spielberg used in his hit movie Jaws, the local real estate developers. This time, instead of telling people it's safe to go back in the water, they've been <laughs> up to other dirty tricks. I'm not even going to tell you what they did, but they shouldn't have. The whole movie is just that silly, and we never do find out if a real poltergeist was involved in the strange events in that haunted house, but Poltergeist is a good summer thriller with good special effects. It's not a great movie. I give it kind of a moderate recommendation. Our first disagreement. I feel so bad about this picture that I think that I'm starting to like Rocky III a little bit more. Really? I th felt that this film wasn't scary except for one door closing and the little childhood fears of being mm -hmm. in the dark at night. And sure. Then all this mumbo-jumbo about spectral light, afterlife. I felt that I was not too far from that garbage movie we once made a dog of the week, uh, Beyond and Back. Beyond and Back. I thought that this, Roger, you just tried to give an explanation, you know, with the, something in the uh -huh. closet. Uh -huh. I never understood it. I haven't talked to a single person that could tell me what is going on in the I'll classroom. meet you after the show. All I have to say is I think the movie works as entertainment. It's not great. It's okay. This film was compared by all the critics to Amateurville Horror, which came out three years earlier in 1979. The consensus was this was slightly better, with more solid storytelling, better special effects, and without Rod Steiger's ham-fisted performance. And although both movies were big box office hits and started mini franchises of their own, neither was considered a classic. This is a PG-rated film. I think for young kids it's too strong. If I had seen this movie when I was seven, I would have been afraid to go to bed until I was 12. I think it's probably too strong for young people, but I don't think that they should even bother with it. I think there's a better film, much better films around the summer. Pottergeist initially received an R rating from the MPAA, as the PG-13 rating did not come into effect until 1984, which might have been an appropriate rating for Pottergeist. Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper disagreed with the R rating and managed to have the film changed to a PG rating on appeal. Some of my films uh, have been controversial in that some people feel that perhaps Jaws should have received an R rating, not a PG rating. But I only really consider myself someone who makes movies that are restrictive for younger people. 
uh, the rating board has a very, very good point. They rate films for parents, not for children. Uh, it's a warning to parents to supervise their children's uh, well-being and to either allow or forbid them to see a movie. That's what PG is all about, parental guidance. To find a classic in the haunting house genre, most critics would point to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining or Robert Wise's The Haunting. The film received three Academy Award nominations, Best Original Score, Best Sound Effects Editing and Best Visual Effects, all of them losing to Spielberg's other film, E.T. the Extra Terrestrial. As such a marketable name, some began to question Spielberg's role during production. Suggestions that Spielberg had greater directorial influence than the credits suggest were aided by his comments. Toby isn't a take charge sort of guy. If a question was asked and an answer wasn't immediately forthcoming, I'll jump in and say what we could do. And Toby would agree or not. And that became the process of collaboration. Weighing in on who actually directed Poltergeist debate, Zelda Rubinstein was definitely on Team Spielberg. She said Toby Hooper couldn't even direct traffic. The Directors Guild of America opened an investigation onto the question of whether or not Hooper's official credit was being denigrated by statements Spielberg had made, apparently claiming authorship. Co-producer Frank Marshall told the Los Angeles Times that the creative force of the movie was Stephen. Toby was the director and was on the set every day. But Stephen did the design for every storyboard and he was on the set every day, except for three days when he was in Hawaii with George Lucas. However, Hooper stated that he did fully half of the storyboards. Frank Marshall and actress Zelda Rubenstein have stated that Spielberg cast the film, directed the actors, and designed every single storyboard for the movie himself. Based on the evidence, the DGA opened a probe into the matter, but found no reason that co-director credit should go to Spielberg. The Hollywood Reporter printed an open letter from Spielberg to Hooper in the week of the film's release. Regrettably, some of the press has misunderstood the rather unique creative relationship which you and I shared throughout the making of Poltergeist. I enjoyed your openness in allowing me a wide berth for creative involvement, just as I know you were happy with the freedom you had to direct Poltergeist so wonderfully. Through the screenplay, you accepted a vision of this very intense movie from the start, and as the director, you delivered the goods you performed responsibly and professionally throughout. And I wish you great success on your next project. The Poltergeist series has long been the subject of a legend that holds that there is a curse associated with the film. The 1982 death of 22-year-old Dominic Dunn. Dunn was murdered by her ex-boyfriend when he strangled her after she rebuffed his attempt to reconcile. Poltergeist was the only film Dominic Dunn appeared in that was a theatrical film. Heather O'Rourke, Carol Ann in all three movies, died in 1988 at the age of 12 from cardiac arrest caused by septic shock from a bowel obstruction caused by intestinal stenosis after being misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1987. Heather O'Rourke who played the little girl Carol Ann and Dominic Dunn who played the teenage daughter are buried in the same cemetery, Westwood Memorial Park in Los Angeles. There was a remake of the same name filmed in late 2013. It got released in theaters on May the 22nd, 2015. But this was a very lightweight, unscary reboot of Poltergeist. It starred Sam Rockwell. The film makes a few references to the original. The film really shouldn't have been made. It falls in the failed remake bin. Poltergeist, although directed by Toby Hooper, has Spielberg's style written all over it. What about Poltergeist? What can you tell us about that? Just that it's real scary. <laughs> it's real scary. It's sort of a land jaws for me. It's, 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 it's a movie about ghosts, but it's not a send-up. It's not a comedy. It's really a movie about 
a haunting in suburbia. It has a lot of reality and it has a lot of extraordinary special effects in it. It doesn't come across to me as just a horror, but fantasy as well. It has so many memorable moments and through the horror, there are many sweet moments and you really feel for this family. Craig T. Nelson and Joe Beth Williams have a great chemistry together and are really believable as concerned parents. What they go through is truly horrific. The effects still hold up today, 35 years later. RLM were truly masters in their game. This is truly a gem of a film. I mean, how could you forget that line? They're here. It becomes a part of popular culture forever. This movie is truly a classic. My name is Jonathan Bark. Thanks for watching.